just tell us about your dual citizenship, your dual identity. You were born, raised and trained in Norway, but you live in Denmark? I live in Copenhagen, yeah. Copen- All right, okay. Oh. It's just because I moved there when I was 21 years old um, to go take one extra year of, of, of theatre school. And then I got work there at the theatre, so I worked there for three years, and then um, then I just, you know, I wanted to stay because I thought it was convenient and easier for me to have to, to work in both countries. Okay, work. if you have more work, is there more work in Denmark than there is in Norway for a young film actor like you? I think there's there's work in both. I'm just as much of work in both in Denmark and in Norway. It's just, since I'm from Norway, it's easier for me to, you know, freshen up my Danish if I live there because you know because it comes easier for me to speak Norwegian than Danish well so. well, just firstly congratulations on Gold Coast thank you which is a, a remarkable film well about the Danish colonization of Africa and the slave trade but Jacob can I just get you yeah. in your own words to describe the film for us definitely Gold Coast is about Denmark Sweden Norway being a part of the slave trade and um, it's actually just after it got forbidden. Um, but the true story is Denmark kept on selling slave for 50 more years because it was more profitable than than doing something else. But my character is a botanist, so I go down to Africa to start a coffee plantation. And I find out that uh, Denmark is still selling slaves. So that's more or less where this story begins. And it's a beautiful it's a beautiful film. It's different. It's hard, of course. It's brutal with, with, um, with the slave trade and everything. But it's it's also very beautiful. And a man meeting a botanist meeting Africa, and and at that time. Now the character you played is a amalgam, I understand, of a number of characters. Yeah. But his experience basically reflects what went on, and it's through him that we get to experience what is understood to be the historical truth of this episode in Scandinavian history. How well known is this episode among the general population? Not very known at all, which is a problem, I think, you know, because cause this happened and not very many people actually know about it. So What's that why. due to? Bad education or I think so. people or maybe, living in denial? Or? Maybe, because, maybe because, you know, we weren't the worst, you know, because the Brits have taken a lot of... You know, the blame and, and the Dutch and the Portuguese as well. But, um, you know, we because we weren't the worst, we ha- we don't have any, we don't feel that like we have any obligation to tell the story, I mm. guess, but which you, is wrong, I think. Well, you, I was just going to ask, yeah. but you obviously felt that obligation. Was, yeah. was that part of the motivation that you felt this story needed to get out? Yeah, I mean, it's important. It's important to know our story. It's important to, to know that, you know, we, we've done this. And, and also the sort of fascination about how can people be so brutal uh, you know for and for what cause i mean and and how can you how can you actually do that and and get to go to sleep at night you know? it is a remarkable story and as you say it there are moments of brutality in it what i was most interested in in terms of your performance is that this must have been like a great, big, juicy, succulent meat pie of a roll <laughs> yeah. for you yeah, definitely. because of the arc yeah. that your character goes on. Yeah. Starts out being a botanist, a man of peace, at one with nature. He loves the natives and is all sweet and light and all the rest of it. Then he becomes aware of what's going on and basically turns into a soldier, yeah, yeah, yeah. an anti-slavery soldier. Yeah, And it's the look on your face when you actually enter battle, if you like, for the first time, yeah. that really registers how much the character is going through and that he's not really expecting things to get this bad. No, 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 no. I would definitely say, yeah. I, I it was I read the script and I was like, this part is I'm not gonna let this go away from me. I mean, it's not very often you get that kind of character and uh, in in this you know, period piece and working with Daniel Danschek was a great writer and and director as well. And it's he wanted to, it to be different. You know, he wanted it to be more documentary, more you know, and 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 more more of a. It's just a. It's a bigger movie than just the story about how it went down. You know, it's it's about what can make people do this to other people. Why do we draw lines and borders and fight fight? 
you know for land that is now is how can we and how wh why does you know history s keep repeating itself down there all the same was it a matter of you s reading the role and going this is going to just take me on such a journey um that you know this is the kind of thing that you kind of dream of exactly mm. it was it was a dream role definitely and yeah. i had to lose a lot of weight you know as i was gonna becomes, ask yeah, yeah yeah he he becomes very sick at some point my character so it's emaciated you're emaciated what did you do to go through that kind of weight loss oh it was just very hard i I've, I've had a uh, um you know a doctor that was you know through the entire process and i got like um yeah, i got this plan of what to eat and what not to eat, especially what not to eat and when to eat and everything. So it was hard. It was definitely it was so hard doing that role where you're on all the time and you film like 16 hours a day and then not eating almost anything was tough, of course. Now, I do want to just ask you about the point of cinema acting as an educational tool. This is a topic that's come up with a number of other filmmakers mm. where they really want their movie to educate people and to hopefully change some minds. Yeah. Now, you can do that with a documentary, Yeah. but filmmakers choose not to make... This could have been a documentary, a two-hour documentary, with you narrating it or something like that, or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. you in recreated scenes, but yeah. it could have been a documentary. Instead, filmmakers, actors prefer the mediation mm -hmm. of a semi-fictionalized story over a documentary. Jacob, as a young actor, can you tell me why you think people respond better to a real life story that has been mediated through acting, through scripting, and through a certain degree of fictionalization rather than a straight telling of the facts? I mean, that's a good that's a good uh, question because I don't I don't entirely agree though. Because I think, you know, a, a documentary is great. I love watching documentaries as well. And I think that can be so fascinating. And But I, I mean, even documentary is someone filming the truth and very often chooses to edit it and do whatever so it gets a good story out of it. And you could never know if that's the truth or not, you know. But um, I think the reason why we have to to do it and make those movies are because we need to know what we come from and learn from history so we don't do the same mistakes again. And that's why it's important to make the fiction as well, not just the documentary, because and we need to feel it in our bones and in our body and not just having someone sit down in front of the camera talking about what happened and then play it a little bit out, whatever. Cinema does have that unique power, doesn't it? Exactly, the, the fiction. And, and yeah. you know, the feeling of getting... I, I very often feel that if you go into a cinema, you want to see people do mistake, make mistakes. So that it's not... Because we're all very afraid of do, making mistakes in our lives. And then we walk into a cinema and you see someone making mistakes and it's wonderful because, you know, it. it you go home and it's, you say, it's okay. It's okay, I'm not, I'm not a bad person after all, whatever. So... I think we we want it and we need it to learn and to to develop and to have the space where we can just you know get away from our own lives and and you know just fly away for a couple of hours. Now I got to be careful with this next bit because mm. you seem like a very nice gentleman and a very well spoken, modest guy. Jacob, can you just put your modesty just aside for a second? <laughs> okay. And and just tell us because you are the lead in this movie. This is a huge film, Gold Coast. Mm. It's a huge budgeted film. You also had a major part in 1864. Yeah, yeah. Which was, people here loved that series. Again, enormous production. Directors and producers don't put people in front of the camera with big productions like that unless they have a lot of confidence that that person's going to deliver. So can you just tell us, in your own words, and with modesty aside, <laughs> yeah. how big a deal you are in Scandinavia? Oh wow! It's I know it's <laughs> tough, but you yeah. know you've come, you know you came into my studio and well, you shall answer the question. Yeah, and you shall. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Wow. Um, how big a deal? How big a deal? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm. As an actor, you're just happy and lucky to get work, um, especially 
it, it, I know every actors all over the world know that and the competition is hard and you always want your role the next role to be the best you've ever made and then you see it in a year after and it's like oh I should have done that and that different because you always develop and I don't know how big a deal I'm just I've just been lucky I feel that I've just started in many ways you know this Gold Coast is one of my biggest roles ever so it's my first huge lead and then in Danish uh, Danish film and um, you know so I feel that you know I've just started and I think it's so you know with the experience now it's funnier to go to work so hopefully I will just you know keep doing fun things and so it's your first major lead in a big film yeah can I also ask you as a <laughs> Danish actor yeah. how does Hollywood figure in to your understanding of the film world is Hollywood a place that ultimately you want to go to is it a place of ultimate ambition and achievement or is it just this other place I mean are you waiting for a phone call is that the ultimate goal or is it just this at a place where they make sequels and prequels and reboots and so on. <laughs> sequels and reboots. That's all I've been watching the last couple of weeks, mate. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. I mean, um, still, it's f far away. I, I think it's uh, growing up as a Scandinavian actor, thinking about Hollywood, people laughed at you, you know? And then suddenly now, so many of my colleagues are actually working on, you know, American-speaking productions. And it's fascinating, you know, I think it's great and I'm so proud of them, you know, and it's fun and, and everything. And, 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 but, uh, but still for me, it feels absurd and surrealistic. I would love to, if, you know, if there's a good project and, you know, if it's, if they want me to, to, to do something, you know, fun, but we'll see what happens. I don't know. You know, why do you act? I act because it's the only thing I'm good at and, uh, it, I think it's extremely fun, and um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I love all the the potential in it for me, and that it's always something I can work with, and uh, always getting better, always working with the small details, and there's so many aspects of it. It's so possible to just expand in so many ways. So. Do you actually see acting as a way of? improving or informing yourself just as a person that or is it well. just a job no no uh, uh, that as well yeah definitely but but mostly it's a job and then sometimes while working with uh, you know some matters so some problems you actually learn something about yourself as well self as well when as a young actor you became aware of how rich the history of scandinavian cinema is in, in terms of its influence on the world. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you've got Igmar Bergman, of course. Yeah, of course. Unqualified genius of cinema. Yeah. I'm not going to say on the other extreme because these are good filmmakers as well, but the Dogma guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. for instance. Lars von Trier. Yeah. You, Lars von Trier, um, uh, Winterberg and so yeah, on, yeah, yeah. who also have, in some cases, crossed over and done English language films. Definitely. It's a very rich, very diverse, very varied firmament yeah. in which you're, you're, you're developing. I'm keen to know when you became aware of, of that side of the nature of Scandinavian cinema. I mean, Dogma was there when I started theatre school, you know, and, and Bergman as well. But this, but the, but the huge, you know, all the Scandinavians going to abroad and filming and especially as actors as well, that started not that long ago, you know. So it's, I mean, Lars von Trier has always fascinated me. I think he's a great artist. It's Winterberg as well. They, you know, they are asking so many interesting questions and always pushing themselves as well as artists, which are great to watch. You know, every new, every time Winterberg or Trier makes something, it's always fascinating or interesting to watch. So, I mean, and for me as going abroad, I mean, that would be, that would be great and wonderful, you know, if, if, if it, happens but you know it's so hard and and it's hard being an actor it's hard just to get work and and it's even harder over there so we'll see what happens